for, um, you know, hey, you have the statistics on um, where the RT patch is, right? And after asking a few people for the slides, I cut and paste them. So the, sl the only slides I have are not mine. I copied them. So uh, just well, this slide's mine. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, real quick update. Um, I'm sure you hear about the preempt RT patch. Uh, it's been going on. I'll just give a little history. Uh, back in 2004, uh, it was a little small project started by Ingo Molnar. Uh, was called, I think, the real-time preempt patch to try to convert Linux into a real-time operating system. There was a lot of other things like Linux RT or RT Linux, I guess it was called, by Victor or something or other. Um, I can't remember. I can never pronounce his last name, so I'm not going to try. And what that was was more of a microkernel that ran as like a real-time, and it was almost like a hypervisor where uh, Linux just was a kind of a guest. But for these type of... Um, uh, real-time platforms, which turn into RTAI, which I think is now Zenomai. Zenomai, I guess, is still around today, still has the same things. They have their use cases because you can get really, really small, and if you really want to verify the entire kernel, having a small microkernel, it makes that possible. Uh, the problem with this approach is the fact that your applications that need to run real-time have to know about the interface on how to communicate to that microkernel. And because what happens is when your real-time application runs on one of these things, it doesn't really run in Linux. It runs on top of the microkernel, and Linux is just pushed off to the side. Our approach was like, let's make Linux itself into a real-time kernel. And that, a lot of people, I hate the term like hard real-time. I'm glad I haven't heard this term in a long time. You know, soft real-time, hard real-time. Good, because it's no such thing as that. Uh, real time just means that you could guarantee, um, it's basically you could guarantee outcomes. It's deterministic. Uh, I hate, I always use a joke, I say this in all my uh, talks, you know, I hate the term real time because it's so ambiguous. You, you know, whenever you hear real time, you don't know if they mean like, oh, real time delivery, whatever that means. Um, but really what uh, our TOS is, is a deterministic operating system, or DOS. Um, I guess people don't laugh at much anymore. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, it's all about determinism. And I, mean, I know I have some, this one guy that I worked with a while ago, he used to say that real time, or every system, whoops, every operating system is real time because there's always a deadline. Uh, if you're typing on like Microsoft Word or something, and every time you pressed a letter, it took two seconds to show up, you failed your deadline. So you may not be able to say what that deadline is, but there is one there. So every single operating system actually has real-time requirements. And I also like to tell people that, you know, if you go real-time, it doesn't mean that you're going to get fast. Everyone thinks, uh, Paul McKinney gave this nice talk called, you know, real-time versus real fast. And the thing is, what, what real-time is is about guaranteed outcomes. So we real-time is the fastest, worst-case scenario you'll have. So if you run your system on normal Linux, it's great. It'd be faster. If like all your benchmarks might be faster than uh, running it with the preempt RT enabled, but you'll find outliers that could cause the system to crash if the requirements deem it. So that's basically what uh, real time is. But back, like I said, 2004, we started on this little project. Uh, Thomas Collection took over. Oops, is it still there? Okay. Thomas Collection took over. I don't know if it's, I can hear this, but I don't hear my voice. Maybe it's, can you hear me? Okay. So, and then um, in 2007, I gave a talk at Old, uh, Ottawa Linux Symposium, and all the, do all the articles about real-time was, um, it always said, real-time Linux by Ingo Molnar, Thomas Kleckscher, and others. So I got up there and said, hey, everyone, I'm others. <laughs> so I've been working on it since 2004 with them, um, and... I don't really, I'm not as much involved as much as I like. I do run, I do uh, run the stable RT. So right now my, my effort has been trying to keep the stable real-time kernels going. So when you, ha when you have the development real-time, but there's other releases that any time we have uh, upstream has a real-time, or sorry, a stable release, long-term stable release, we try to follow that with a real-time patch to have the real-time stable release. So if, you, if there's a real-time state, or is there a long-term stable release, LTS, uh, kernel, we try to have a real-time kernel following the same. So let's move forward and see the direction of where real-time is right now, the preempt. Uh, this is, like I said, I copied this slide, and it shows the patch queue status uh, up to 19 RC1. We're at RC3 now, I believe. Um, you can see we've actually shrunk the patch set quite a bit. 
What that means is the stuff is going into um, mainline. And a long time ago, uh, I mean, John Corbett and LWN used to always predict that this year the real-time patch will be there. He's been doing that for the last 10 years. <laughs> yeah, what's the roadmap? And uh, uh, with the roadmap one, I told his collection showed his roadmap. It was a, it was a picture of uh, the city with all the bars. Um, but anyway, I always told people, like, everyone says, when is the real-time patch going into the kernel? I'm like, it is. It is going in. I mean, every year it goes in. People don't realize Ftrace is from the real-time patch. Lockdep is from the real-time patch. Mutex. The Mutex code in the Linux kernel did not exist until the real-time patch introduced it. Believe it or not, it used to be semaphores. And we went around and we saw all the mutual exclusive locations inside the kernel was actually a semaphore down, semaphore up. And this is back in 2005 or so, or 2006. The real-time we, real patch required that a mutex had to have an owner. Semaphores don't have owners. So we introduced the mutex code to introduce that. So we, the mutex code in the Linux kernel is from the real-time patch. So all these years, um, real-time patch has been going into the kernel. And, the, and it's funny, every time you watch the patch shrink, it suddenly grows up again because we decide to implement something else. <laughs> so it was like, believe it or not, there was a small time that KVM was actually in the real-time patch <laughs> because they, they, they wanted to practice, they wanted, someone wanted to test it. We said, oh, we'll pull it in. <laughs> um, this is the current state of where we're at, at least at RC1. Uh, we're down to 49 patches. So coming down from like about 350. And although it might grow, uh, because if you looked on the Linux kernel mailing list this week, um, a patch set went out to revert to print K updates. <laughs> it hasn't been pulled into Linux yet, but it probably will, and we have to do a take two on it, because we've discovered an issue um, actually, yeah, someone reported it, and Lena said, this is on you guys. You've got to fix it. And we said, well, we're, well we've, we had a big hammer approach to fix it, but we, well, I was saying, you know, we need to do this properly because this, this opened up a window like, oh, it's kind of like the Spectre thing, you know? When no one thought about all the issues of Spectre uh, vulnerabilities, but once they did, you're like, oh, let's look at other places that this Spectre thing could be. The issue with the print K problem, the consoles, we have to go and look at and say, okay, and we want to make sure we do it right. So, um, so print K may grow up again, but hopefully it will be packaged with the rest of the kernel or the rest of the changes. Um, essential is basically the big switches that turn that allow you to turn on um, preempt RT. Everyone, the config preempt RT config is in there. You'll see config preempt real time or, or RT preempt RT is in the kernel. Everyone says congratulations, you got preempt RT in there. It's in the code. All the code is there. It has a switch but nothing enables it. It says depends on have real time and nothing has real time. No architecture has it. <laughs> so we got it in there, but you can't turn it on. Okay, that's, that's the essential code. Um, and this view X here, the rest is just a bunch of changes that we have all over the place. Um, little, little details that just need to be cleaned up, uh, minor things, nothing to really, nothing that's hard, it's just, yeah, some code in the kernel didn't quite, or it makes, it, it makes an issue with real time, and we just have to clean, modify the code a little bit, which means that we need to have education and teach people how not to do that anymore. Uh, again, this is the breakdown of uh, patches, files, uh, things. But that's all my slides are, because this buff was actually most to be more for q and A. I I think I kind of gave a little story about how everything is, so I guess, uh, anyone have any questions? I want to see here. By the way, I'm in the real time tree here, and I was just doing. If you want to see what the like, well, let's see. Can you see this? Let me make it bigger. Uh, Is that right? So we can actually walk down all the uh, patches if you want. <laughs> if no one has any questions, we could do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, I can appreciate your disdain for the, the hard real-time uh, nomenclature that's used, but do you think that, or what, what could a, a developer use to convince um, management or, or higher-ups that say, we have to use a, a proper RTOS for safety critical or for like flight controls or things like that um, instead of using Linux? Is there an argument that you could help us make to say, yep, Linux has what we need and it'll be able to, to do the job? Before I give it to Tim, I think I'd rather have you hand that right back to the person I gave it to, and he'll answer that question. <laughs> Introduce yourself. Uh, so, uh, I'm Daniel. I work with the real-time people as well, more in the analysis side. And, uh, and the real-time for this question on going towards safety critical systems, right? The real-time pet set is part of a bigger effort on trying to create the, the artifacts that are needed for the certification of Linux to a class of safety critical systems. The, the patch set is fundamental to that because it simplifies the task model of Linux and it simplifies the way that we can demonstrate that we can uh, deliver a, a predictable time to, to the failure, to detect and to react to the failure. And then that's the main reason why the, the RT is important for, for the safety critical systems. Obviously, we have the, the, the need to do predictable deadlines for the tasks, right? The, the, these are important, but this goes almost towards a, a quality of service because the most important thing for enabling Linux on, on safety criticals nowadays is being able to have predictability on reacting to failures. And so in this special case, the RT helps there because as I said, because the task model is simpler, because like we don't have software queues, uh, we have a very short uh, preempted disable section, so it's e it's faster to react to events, and it's faster or easier to provide evidences that uh, this is doable. So it, it's part of the problem, it's part of the, the solution for this problem, but it's a bigger problem. And there is a working group inside of uh, Linux Foundation that is working on that. Uh, on working on, on trying to describe, for example, for me to certify the, the Linux to run on, on cars, it needs to be AZOB. And then they get the, the rules, like the ISO, they try to decompose the ISO and, and uh, try to create artifacts to justify the, the safety arguments. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's beyond technology, there's also procedures, and there is this working group at the Linux Foundation. The, the name is Elisa or Eliza, depending on your accent. And, and there are many companies involved on there. Uh, Kate probably can, can talk better than myself about it. But the DRT is a fundamental part of, of this process. Do you want? Oh, I just. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, Tim. Yeah. Uh, Elisa just stands for enabling Linux and safety applications. So if you're interested in the safety space, uh, we're pretty open. Uh, the videos are there, and we would welcome having more of kernel people participating to make sure that the argumentation is sound. And just before Tim goes on, I just want to see if, if, I, if I get to see if I can ex just explain in layman terms, like Elisa or Liza, whatever. Um, I'm going to try to do this. Basically, let's say you can't, you can't guarantee everything in the kernel because the space is so big to do, you know, it's a, uh, you know, NP complete problem. So what the idea is, can you prove that if something goes wrong, you have, you put in place that something that you can prove that, that babysits that uh, code to make sure it's doing, it's moving along as is. And if it ever detects a failure where something, it did something that's not good, you have a safe way of, uh, of getting around that. So basically you implement um, a, Catch all like a like a, like I said a watchdog or something that just monitors, you know that this is moving the way we expect it to move. If not, you have a safe way of getting out of it and warning everyone and saying, okay, we're going to safe mode, we're shutting down and moving on. Um, I believe is that basically yep, uh, yep. the the high level ten thousand foot view of things. <laughs> I think that the, the key thing is that um, safety always happens as as part of a system, and there are different ways to make it safe. Some of which, one of which is the, the time, you know, having a separate process, doing a watchdog. Some of it's some things inside. Some of it is basically just doing the trace analysis to prove that certain things will not happen. So there's many techniques that have to be used and are available to use. So 
the group Mona Lisa is basically, there's different subgroups in there looking at different parts of these things, so it's just a question of what your application is, but the key insight is safety is a, a function of a system, not just a component. Yep, yeah. and Tim, sorry. <laughs> oh, did you forget what you were going to talk about? <laughs> Okay, so um, in terms of arguments to executives, we've, uh, we've been doing this a long time. Uh, there's a misconception that because a system is small, it's necessarily uh, more proven uh, or it's better analyzed. Um, and that's not always the case. Uh, if you want to throw big words at your management, say stochastic. Uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, Linux has, the preempt RT patch has been used in a huge number of products uh, that have hard real times. Uh, one of the ones that you can throw out is that SpaceX rockets, like the Falcon 9 rocket, uses Linux real time. Uh, the Tesla full self-driving, well, it's not full self-driving, and <laughs> the, the mistakes that a Tesla car has made have not been related to real time. Uh, <laughs> it's always, not preempt RT. <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's not preempt RT's fault if a Tesla goes off the road. Um, but uh, so, I mean, it's uh, one of, the, we used to do this a lot with routing that people would always say, well, if you have like this tiny, tiny kernel, uh, you're, you're going to be able to just do networking faster because your code paths are shorter. It's like, well, no, there's also things like the algorithms that you use and, uh, and the amount, and, and so those types of things affect the, the real-time guarantees that you can provide in a system. Uh, so anyway, that, that's my answer to okay. what, what to say to management. And I guess the next follow-up is, if you need to talk to someone, I would, after this meeting, talk to Tim, talk to Kate, uh, and maybe we could help you get resources that you need to go back to your management and uh, prove your case. Sir, uh, I had two questions. Uh, the first one is about uh, the Yocto project has a reference kernel called Linux Yocto RT. And I believe it, I've never tried it, but I believe it could be, uh, you could build an image and put it up on KMU. Is that a good platform to test real time KMU? Or so basically, wait, you mean testing on KMU? Yeah, yeah. Because it's well, convenient, right? Oh, I don't okay, need well, board. matters what you want to test. You want to test if your applications will run? Sure. Yeah. Well, what, do you want to test to see if your applications will run uh, within their deadlines? Maybe not so much. Um, <laughs> but no, actually, when I left Red Hat, there was a project of making um, real-time guests. And the idea, and actually, I've seen a lot of really good work on that. So if you want to use on QMU, one thing is what you do, would, you would boot up your kernel, your, the, hard, the bare metal kernel, with the preempt RT patch, real-time. Then you would set the QMU process to a real-time process and isolate it onto a CPU that runs by itself. So basically, in essence, your QMU emulator is now almost bare metal because it's got a dedicated CPU, do all the work to isolate it nicely, and run real time on that way. And guess what? You probably will get the, pretty much the same guarantees that you would running on bare metal. But does the host uh, machine also need to have preempt RT? That's why I said you boot up bare metal on a preempt RT kernel. On a preempt RT kernel. Okay, okay. But if you isolate, actually you don't even need to do that because isolated CPUs, if you do it properly, like the Linux 519 should have enough information in there or enough um, tooling in there to actually isolate processes. But no hertz full. If no you enable no hertz full, okay. Okay. not no hertz, no hertz full. No hertz full. What no hertz full is, how many people are unfamiliar with what no hertz full is? Okay, good, so I'll explain it to you. What no hertz full is, is a, if there's no reason to call the timer tick. In other words, if you have a single process, if it's a real-time process, that there's no one, nothing that's going to interrupt it, scheduled on a single CPU, the tick will turn off. And once it goes into user space, it will stay in user space and never go into the kernel unless it actually does a system call. It will, you have to, to get this to work, you also have to make sure you move the interrupt um, affinity off that CPU. Uh, I usually boot with, you know, ISO CPUs enabled. There's a few things you have to do to get this working properly. You've got to push car, uh, RCU no call callbacks off there. Um, so there's a few things. Once you get that all isolated, uh, then you call um, no hertz full. And when you have your process, if it's a single process running on there, if it's a non-real-time task and there's other tasks, the tick will still go. So that, you know, that periodic tick, you know, your 1,000 hertz or 100 hertz or whatever config you do, that will turn off while the, the task is running. So if QMU, if it's running and it doesn't have to go to do system calls, which it probably will and do something, so it might get actually be interfered. Um, 
actually, I mean, we got, I, I was shocked. Um, the benchmarks we got uh, when I left, I mean, the KMU doing this was like within less than 100 microseconds yeah. of latency of cyclic yeah. tests running on full load. Just so people know, I work for Red Hat and I work on this kind of setup. The, if you do proper isolation and, and try to run uh, the guest, like the, the host running PremTRT, it might also work without the PremTRT, and then you run the guest running the PremTRT, and the, the <coughs> real CPU and the virtual CPU are, are isolated, right? And you dedicate a process to run there, it, uh, the latency, the OS noise is up to 10, 20 microseconds. Yeah, <coughs> so 10, 20 microseconds of uh, yeah, latency. And there is there's one <coughs> tuning tool that uh, Red Hat ships and, and, and other distro probably ship as well is Tunity. It has profiles, and there's one profile which is the real-time profile and the re real-time virtualization profile that automates the isolation for, well, for this use case. So it, it's possible and gives good results. Obviously, if you want to try to debug, the problem sometimes is synchronizing the, the debug from the kernel and the host but uh, the, the results are, are, are good already. Yeah. Yeah, second question was, uh, there is a processor from ARM, uh, Cortex-R, real time, that's what they call it, right? So is, is that kind of uh, applicable to preempt RT? Uh, I don't know if it's been brought up or not, but I'm, I'm just asking, I wonder yeah. what that processor is for. Yeah. It doesn't. Wait, can, you get, uh, can you take the mic to answer? <laughs> If there's someone in ARM here in the audience can correct me, but it, I don't believe it really, it's running Linux. It's um, got two different servers. It's got some restrictions and so forth in it. So it tends to just be used for, like the M cores and the R cores are being used roughly for the same functionality. Possibly, but I, I, like I say, I have not seen a port. Uh, what did you say? You said something that could run he like said, no MMU. Yeah, no MMU. Yeah, could yeah. run no MMU. So it's, uh, basically that's unrelated to, I guess, preempt RT and actually Linux in general. Just last, last question here, then I move to the other side. Uh, so if there is a user space code given a kernel code, if they designed badly, uh, have uh, they schedule that one as a 5 RT80, then do a while loop and uh, doing there a long time. So it's a system, right? So if somebody have bad kernel driver code or user space code, they can actually um, Make the, with the preempt RT, then it will. Well, I think we, you're, so you're asking, like, say, so use, yeah, it's a user space code. The thing about the advantage of preempt RT, then from the other, like, you know, ZenMI and stuff like that, is the fact that it's normal Linux code. So if it runs on normal Linux, it will run on preempt RT, and, but preempt RT will have you better latencies. And if you create a user space tool, called, uh, tool and set the priority to 80, and there's nothing else in the system that has is over 80. It will run when it runs. It could run forever in a while loop. Right. By the way, you do have to do some station. I mean, uh, I don't want to mispronounce your name. <laughs> Gracian. Gracian. Gracian gave a great talk yesterday yeah. Uh, yeah. about He's everything saying. that we talked about. So Gracian, go download the video. Yeah, RT throttling. Uh, yeah, what was the name of the talk? Yeah, 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 tips and tricks for RT tuning. So, so when I talked about isolated CPUs, so he actually mentioned a lot of that stuff on how to do that. And, and also I gave him a great segue because I was like, you forgot about RCU no, call, no callbacks. And he goes, great segue, he hits the next slide. On the next slide it says RCU no callbacks. <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to, so the comment was, what if there's like a bad driver or what if you have bad oh. user space code? Oh, and so, so yeah, those are issues, right? So if you have a driver that for some reason has like a code path that's not coded properly, uh, then that's something that might need to be fixed. Uh, and the same thing with user space. This stuff doesn't just magically happen. You actually have to put your processes in the right scheduling classes, right, and at the right priorities. So there is still the analysis. It's not just magic. Yeah, it's a system that you have to analyze. Great point that you always have to do the analysis. Yeah, you always have to do analysis. I, I gave a talk once basically about, you know, hard real time is hard. There is no magic bullet. And the number of people that, and, and the sad part is some of the people say, hey, I'll just put real time on it or the preempt RT patch and everything will work, run just fine. 
And I'm like, well, yeah, your SMIs take milliseconds. You know, uh, <laughs> there's, I, I have another talk, Kernel Recipes. RTLA? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So, Dan unfortunately, I had a conflict with Daniel's talk yesterday. I had to be at a board meeting. <laughs> so, uh, when uh, RTLA was there, uh, I really wanted this. That was actually one of my highlights of the talks. <laughs> I was going to come watch is Daniel's talk yesterday at RTLA. So, I can't talk to it because I wasn't there. But, but everyone, everyone, including myself, need to go back and watch the video of uh, uh, Daniel's RTLA talk. Yeah, it's, it's a new tool that there is in the kernel that helps to analyze the timing behavior of the system. Yeah, yeah. yeah so it's real-time Linux analysis tool. I got an easy one. Um, most of my team, we work with um, SOC vendor, blah, blah, blah. Uh, most of my team spends a lot of effort in term, terms of uh, optimizing power for a system until we get to customers and they enable RT. You enable uh, what? Uh, real time. Um, okay. Preem RT the entire shebang for it, and of course CPU freq, of course CPU idle, for short. Is there anything that we are doing to see if we can marry these two together, where we can have CPU freq and CPU idle active with Preem RT? Okay. So I think the question is basically it's a you know power versus the power savings versus real time. Is that basically what you're asking now? Um, I used to always joke, if you really want real, real-time responsiveness, you better invest in air conditioning. Um, <laughs> because, uh, okay, yes, the best thing for real-time, or I mean power savings, is when you're idle and you go, you turn the CPU off. You know, the deep C states, you go down. Problem with that, that could take a long time to bring the CPU back up. So if, I mean, what's like, a, like, what's like the longest? A millisecond maybe to, uh, to wake up? A, if its CPU goes full deep sleep, that's like almost a millisecond to bring it back up to speed. And it's not the same every time. Yeah, and it's not the same every time. So it's, you're talking, like Mario said, real time is about determinism. Now, if your latency or if your deadlines are 100 uh, milliseconds, 100 milliseconds, not microseconds, 100 milliseconds, and some, there are things that have latencies of, in the milliseconds, then yes, great. Go po if, if, you, if everything you could do, because I said it's all about deterministic. If you find the worst case scenario and you say, in this situation, we could go full sleep and then wake up and still make our deadlines and make the latencies and whatnot, you could do that. But a lot of cases like, you know, like high speed trading and stuff like that, they just they put their system into idle equals pole, which just means that it spins. And they just invest in more air conditioning because that really becomes nice little heaters for everyone. Um, so yeah, is, is there anything we could do? It's like one of those things that it's, it's a trade-off. Um, I think that's more of a hardware question. <laughs> I mean, it's not really, there's nothing really you could do in software. It's, I mean, we could do trips and tricks, but I mean, how, what do you do if you want your CPU to be saving low frequencies? But every time you, everything that does power savings will slow things down, which may, will increase the chance of a missed deadline. So. The, j just add on top of it, uh, this cat deadline is aware of the frequency that you're running and it can adjust the tasks for the runtime according to the, the frequency of the processor. That, that's one step forward that direction, but it okay, depends on yeah. your deadline. If you have very short deadlines, you, you, you need to... Now, what might be interesting to do is, I mean, this could probably take work, and I'm not sure if anyone's doing this, maybe someone's already doing this, would be to say if you let your system go to sleep, but you know when the deadline is about to come, and you know when, basically you're saying, okay, we, we're going to have some wake-ups here, but in a minute, basically say, if you can identify windows where there's nothing happening on the CPU and never will, you could possibly write code to put the system into a deep sleep and then wake it up before, before things start happening. So if you know when things are about to happen, if there's some cyclic thing that you're doing, like, okay, we have this window of time where we're going to be doing a lot of things and then a window of just idleness and a window of time, you probably could do something in software that would handle that. That would be an interesting project. I don't know if anyone's doing that. In, yeah, in, in it's, the, yeah, you can't really generalize that. That would be like, yeah. In, in the, the real-time scheduling theory, it's, this is about being clairvoyant, about knowing what will happen in the future. Right? Yeah. But it, you, it, that's not general case. It's not very often, but there is possible cases. Again, hard real time is very much, is like I said, it's hard, and you have to know the entire system which, and your environment. So it's, a, it's not just saying how you have the software. It's like I said, it's the hardware, it's the environment, the interface, everything has to be considered. Yeah. 
It's, there's no magic bullet in it. Yeah. The, the problem maybe is that it's hard to generalize these corner cases, right? And so each solution needs to be customized. Uh, yeah. Just questions from the audience online. Uh, just, I, I'm lost here. There are more questions. Uh, Does Courtney has? Okay, ju just help me because there are more questions. I lost the first. <laughs> Okay, there is Alison asking, that that's probably Xavier, Sebastian, probably. Uh, K timers do not, does not prevent transitions to deep sea states when the non, non clock, non slip, non alarm timers are pending. That's true even when, with uh, Frederick's subsequent uh, bug fix. Thus, others also find that K timers D is not raised when timer FD timers are pending. Okay, wait, say that again. <laughs> yeah. right. Right. Because You've said that like basically very monotone, and that, I'm like, that, okay. That's the, time of the, that's the yeah, kind of yeah, question yeah. that's better on the mailing list. <laughs> Where you can think. Which one is? This is the first. Yeah, K timers does not prevent transitions to deeper. Okay, yeah. Does not prevent. Uh, K timers does not prevent transitions to deeper uh, on when non clock nano sleep, non alarm timers are pending. That's true even with. I, I think that it's related to the idle driver, because the idle okay. driver tries to predict when is the next wake up and try to go to the idle state that's not deeper than, than the next timer. And there are time, he's saying that there are timers that are not being observed for this. I think it's a complementary question for the previous question. Okay. So, yeah, I don't know if I can answer that. <laughs> yeah, it's better on the mailing list. This, yeah, this that's kind of on the, ask on the mailing list, and we'll try to answer that properly. Because you need to think. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's something I have to sit down and probably go back and look at the code. Yeah. <laughs> just a second, just a second. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah, there are hints coming from the CPU idle framework for each of the C states, what are the residency latencies and entry and exit latencies. How do we comprehend that within the timer uh, decision making? When is the next event supposed to happen? When you go no hertz uh, full, what do you need to do? These so, are things that we should probably uh, have a deeper discussion on. Yeah, uh, yes. basically let's refer to the mailing list. Uh, so is there any hope for timer FD and e poll to work with RT? In fact, that's another question I'm not going to be able to answer. Uh, <laughs> I'm not even going to try unless someone else wants to try. I didn't even know about that. That didn't. What kind of design tools do you use to plan the timings other than trial and error? Well, that's like, uh, that's basically here. You want to take your laptop back? <laughs> yeah. um, yep. Uh, that type of question is more of, um, I mean, it's not trial and error. I mean, it's measurements. Um, when I've done anything that has to do with things, we actually say what's the incoming response and what's the outgoing. I know like high-frequency traders have a lot of data saying, here's the requirements. So it's, it's basically you look at the requirements that, of your system that you need, and then you write the code and then you make, yes, yeah, so you have to make the measurement, you have to run it to see what's the worst case scenario. I guess maybe one of the questions is, or actually the other thing is, how do we know that we hit the worst case path? Um, maybe some, would your, does your uh, runtime verifier do something like that? Yeah, we, we can create models to try to, to yeah. capture those cases, yes. So there's a runtime verifier that Daniel is working on that um, allows you to create a model of the system and then Put that into the, at least for the kernel side, you probably would need something for user space as well. Is there something for user space and too? Or? It, I think it will just plug with the user space trace points. Yeah, so if we have user space trace points, it hooks the trace points and it puts that, so you have, you know, the uh, like autonomous model on how you think, and it sets all the states, and then various trace points inside the kernel, you can add more there. It will move the state from next state to next state to next state. If ever something happens outside, I guess you even have timings and stuff in there? No, you, not yet, but the Not yet. Planned. So eventually you'll have timings. Anything ever goes outside that model, you'll get, like, you could panic the system or print, or you could say, what to do when, when like, a greater reaction, say, when this model breaks, what do you do? Um, you could crash this, I mean, you could run this thing, I guess it's pretty fast, so you can run it even in 
production? It, 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 uh, running the model is faster than saving the trace to trace buffer. Right. So you can run in production. Yeah, so there's a question back there. Kind of along those same lines of that, and sorry, I'm not very familiar with the preempt RT stuff, so maybe this is something already answered. But uh, um, one of the things people like to do with those little tiny real-time kernels is uh, do the mathematical proof that they can actually meet all their deadlines. Is there anything that, I mean, how you measure that is always a, uh, you know, how you measure your workloads is always a sticking point with right. doing the so mathematical model, but uh, is like having something that, well, but yeah. he also the runtime verifier seems to, right? Is that Does it do, so it actually will do the mathematical uh, very, very proof for that? Sorry? There is part of the work that I did on the verification was creating a, a model of the synchronization of the parameter RT. And uh, from that model, I could extract the theorems that describe the worst case scenario for the, the latency, the scheduling latency. And I have a published paper where I describe the worst case scenario on the synchronization level, which is the level of the parameter T. And uh, there is a proof of the bound for the scheduling latency there. This will be part of the RTLA tool set that I presented the, yesterday. And uh, that, that, that's for the scheduling latency. And uh, for the scheduling itself, we have a SCAD deadline. And with SCAD deadline, one of the things that we try to maintain it, it's keeping a, a scheduling model that is theoretically correct. And the model that we have there, which is our, uh, basically go, global scheduling that you can reduce to, to cluster or partition scheduling, there is theory that backs it up. So you, you can drive those conclusions. But then, then this, this is more at synchronization and scheduling level. There is the other problem, which is the measurement of the worst case execution yeah, so time. But Tim, we have five and, minutes and, left. And then so. we have a, there are methods to do that, and people are working. I'll, I'll just say real quick that uh, a lot of people, when they do mathematical analysis on code, they're not taking into account uh, the nuances of the architecture. Things like cache hits and, and uh, you know, levels of caches and, and those types of things. And so you can, okay, I read a really good article a couple of weeks ago, which is, uh, uh, you know, your machine is not a PDP-11. Uh, it's not doing in-order execution of anything. There's all these really complicated things going on in the processor, register renaming and everything that makes it so that, like, you can't just, you know, I don't know how good the analysis is. I'm not casting aspersions on it, but I, I've seen analysis that just doesn't take into account all of the stuff going on, the microcode changes that Intel just made on your CPU. Yeah. Um, just want to say one thing, actually, my, so my, what, uh, surprising, I accidentally did something that kind of turned off branch prediction, and it got really bad. I didn't realize how much performance branch prediction gives you which is the whole Spectre meltdown thing, because that was one of the things that Spectre uses is branch prediction. And that is, I mean, that's, some people don't even think about branch prediction. But I didn't realize how much of a performance savings branch prediction, correct branch prediction gives you. The, just add, adding what, what people are doing more in the research side regarding the execution time measurements, right? There is, in, in very simple system, people used to break down every structure and try to compose it. But if you try to do on modern architectures like Intel, where we run, it, it becomes too much uh, pessimistic, right? There is too much pessimistic involved, and sometimes it, it's hard for you to give a worst case execution time. What people are, what the research are, are going, and there are companies that try to go that way as well, is, is use part of this kind of analysis more, more let's say, fine grain but uh, splitting on blocks and having uh, statistical models that help you to give some level of certainty in the, yeah. in the prediction of the worst case execution time. It, it's, it's a complex problem, but there are tools and methods to do it. But most importantly, uh, when you go to, to the safety critical side, maybe more important than this is being able to detect failures and, and, uh, and uh, react accordingly. It's, that, that's the, the way you can work around the misprediction on, on these tools. So I, I read a paper. I wish I knew. I wish I kept. I wish I kept this idea about. And it was basically is the whole idea on this that the theoretical worst case scenario where you say you know that you missed the branch prediction, you missed cache, you missed this, 
is so great compared to the realistic worst, worst case scenario. That if you try to measure, if you try to put your deadlines to the worst case, you know, you're talking in the milliseconds when you actually could be in the microseconds. Um, that's how much of a drastic. So there was a paper on this just like about the statistical analysis to determine the actual or at least the range saying that um, there was a way to, it was a pr had a proof in it that said that by doing this, you could say that it will never be worse than this, which is much, much less than the actual, you know, if I miss every single time you miss, do a cash miss, because that's not realistic. And there was, a, there was a great paper, and I wish I saved it. And I, I, I was like, darn it, I read it like three or four years ago. And I, the the, the yeah. point is that the, in the real-time theory, we are always fighting up against being too pessimistic and being less pessimistic. And that, that's where you, you try to, to be a, as much pessimistic, not to be too much pessimistic. That, that's the, the this fine spot that we try to, to find, right? But for the scheduling latency on the parameter T, because of the design of the code, uh, I, I did the, 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 the theorem and I did the tool for measuring it. Even with the worst case scenario and exposing worst case val measured values and composing the worst case one after the other, the latency was still below one millisecond, even being pessimist. Right. So yeah. the, 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 for the goal of the parameter T, which is trying to, to give better uh, control of the preemption, even with the pessimist, the valor are good. There's a paper on 2020 from my demystifying the real-time scheduling latency. It's on ACRTS. Okay. Uh, I guess we're at time, but I'm just going to do one last call. If you know the paper I'm talking about, because I don't even really know the title, email it to me. <laughs> but anyway, uh, thank you very much. Uh, okay.